Hey, I'm gonna try a different type of video. I'm gonna use information on a variety of nonfiction books I've read to talk about a topic. In this case, should I become a reducitarian? First off, what the hell is a reducitarian? I'd never come across the term myself until I read The End of Animal Farming. According to Collins Dictionary, a reducitarian is someone who reduces the amount of meat and dairy products they consume without becoming fully vegetarian or vegan. When I read about this concept, it seemed like a good idea for myself. I was always looking to improve my physical and mental health, and have no problem being puritanical to achieve this. I gave up hyperpalatable, sugary foods, video games, deleted my social medias, apart from YouTube if that counts. I enjoy identifying deleterious habits and pushing myself to purge them from my life. It had been ingrained in my mind that meat, especially red meat, was bad for you. So what did I do? I began reading that aforementioned book, The End of Animal Farming, and in tandem, reducing my meat intake quite dramatically. A reducitarian sounded perfect for me. It's the little things like pepperoni on your pizza or chorizo in your lentil soup that I find really difficult to give up. I started buying those corn vegetable burgers and reducing stuff like steak to be a very rare treat, maybe once a month. I wasn't really doing all this for ethical reasons. I think we should make meat production as ethical as possible, but I don't consider eating meat to be morally abhorrent. At a stretch, I consider it a necessary evil. I did it because I wanted to reduce my carbon footprint and improve my health. If I didn't have to kill any animals in the process, that was just a nice bonus. As if a harbinger of the morass that was about to come, I found the end of animal farming quite unscientific and strange. It didn't contain much in the way of nutritional information or science. It served more of a, as a guide for activists, arguing about the morality of eating and the technology of meat-free foods. As I mentioned, I don't find meat eating to be terribly immoral, so this book did nothing in persuading me to maintain my diet. After a month or so of this reducitarian diet, I became lethargic. I would require more naps at irregular times and experience brain fog. I didn't attribute my newfound torpor to my diet initially. My partner was pregnant at the time, and she was told she was iron deficient. She wasn't on the same diet, by the way. I began to see parallels between her symptoms and mine. While I encouraged her to eat more red meat, I did the same. I noticed the lethargy began to dissipate. Looking back, it was quite scary. A lot of days felt like a haze or a dream that melted away with nothing being accomplished. I now know that proteins are needed to carry enzymes and oxygen to tissues. Low protein can cause lethargy. I'm not alone either. In Apocalypse Never, I read a lot of similar experiences. Schellenberger quotes Temple Grandin, an animal welfare expert, If I do not eat animal protein, I get lightheaded and have difficulty thinking. That quote hit me like a lightning bolt. From the author Schellenberger's own experience, he says, During the decade I was vegetarian, I grew tired most afternoons after eating a carb-heavy lunch, no matter how much sleep I got the night before. It was only after eating meat again that I could work through the afternoon without feeling sleepy. To reiterate, I found that kind of experience very relatable. In Apocalypse Never, he also cites studies that vegans and vegetarians are more prone to fatigue, headaches, and dizziness because of the deficiency of vitamin B12 and iron in the absence of meat. Speaking of B12 and iron, this is from Sacred Cow. More than 25% of the US population is iron deficient. B12 deficiency is common in vegetarians and vegans and is shown to be a risk factor in coronary artery disease and neurological disorders in infants of vegan mothers. Now coming from Spoonfed, which has in a chapter on the health benefits of veganism and another chapter debunking the idea that meat consumption is unhealthy. In there, he says that studies of children on vegan diets have low levels of B12s, which has even led to some deaths. In France, raising a child on a vegan diet is classed as criminal neglect. Again, drawing from Apocalypse Never, I'm not alone in abandoning my vegetarian-leaning diet. Today, 2-4% to of Americans are vegan-vegetarian. Almost 80% of those who try to become vegan or vegetarian eventually abandon their diet, and more than half do so within the first year. 
I remember hearing in some documentary that humans were hunter-gatherers, but they are primarily gatherers. That quote replayed in my mind as I embraced my reducitarian diet. But in a study from the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, they evaluated more than 200 hunter-gatherers and found that somewhere between 45% to 65% of their calories come from animal foods, the rest from plants. Now on to the second reason that I adopted my reducitarian diet was my carbon footprint. So let's talk about the environmental costs of meat. In Apocalypse Never, I learned that the total land used to produce meat peaked in 2000. This next point isn't really against, you know, vegetarian veganism, but grass-fed beef. Schellenberger states that industrially farmed cattle are sent to slaughter at 14 to 18 months whereas grass-fed cattle aren't slaughtered until 18 to 24 months. Grass-fed cattle gain weight slower and live longer, producing more methane and manure. So it's interesting to note that Schellenberger is actually arguing for industrial beef. But upon reading Sacred Cow, I tend to agree more with them when they argue for more maintainable practices rather than industrially farmed beef. So, where am I now? I've kind of abandoned my reducitarian diet. Now, my diet varies greatly. Fruit, tons of veg, and meat, especially red meat. Spoonfed also encouraged me to eat a lot of lentils and chickpeas, which I do often. I tried to eat liver every once in a while, even though its piquant taste doesn't often agree with me. Liver is loaded with iron to give you energy and a trove of certain B vitamins, most notably B12. But another thing I took away from Spoodfed is because of a huge variety in everybody's gut microbes, it doesn't make sense for a one-size-fits-all solution when it comes to nutrients and other recommendations. And I think this is why the debate is so toxic. I don't think you should admonish people for eating meat. For that matter, I don't think you should impose much diets on people. Something that works for you might not work for other people. Spoonfed also encourages people to, you know, mix up their diet, try different things, skip breakfast every once in a while, and just find what works for you. The point being, diets should and do vary from person to person. Just because you don't eat any meat or eat less meat doesn't mean that someone else should too. We can't expect poorer people to eat the same as richer people. 10% of Americans like cooking. Isn't it quite a big ask to encourage people to switch to a diet that requires a lot of work and planning to maintain? and can have serious negative effects if not done properly. In Apocalypse Never, I saw this quote from Michael Pollan. I have to say there is part of me that envies the moral clarity of the vegetarian, yet part of me pities him too. Dreams of innocence are just that. They usually depend on a denial of reality that can be its own form of hubris. I hope I've shown at least that the view that eating meat equals bad is a bit more complicated than that if not just false. Also, Hitler purported to be a vegetarian. So you're probably a Nazi if you don't eat meat. That's Fosh logic. 